come, we'll start with our second section where we'll be talking about paper 1, section B, that's basically the human geography. Now, the paper was very, very interesting, a kind of very good paper that we would say for human geography. The questions were very, very conceptual and applicative in nature. Now, let's move forward with the very first question. Now, this question is a very simple question, but the language has been a kind of very tricky language for you to understand. The question says, geography is a contested and multi-pragmatic uh, uh, discipline with a strong Eurocentric. Okay, now the theme here is this Eurocentricity has been changing. So what we have to need or what we need to bring about here is the idea that was laid down by Kant. So basically he was the first person who said that geography is uh, the things that are explained through places and history is explained through time. He again said that ge uh, geography is one that touches nearly all the paradigms. So the idea that was laid down by Kant later on explained through social geography which takes on the facets from sociology. You have human evolution that takes from anthropology. You have ideas coming in from economics when we talk about welfare geography. We have ideas that were laid down under Marxist geography by Marxism and so on. So you have numerous disciplines, the science, the social sciences, humanities, which are a kind of um, multidimensional approach under geography that we say. Initially, when geography started, it was predominantly the European scholars. So you had Ritter, Humboldt, Kant, then you had uh, Davis, Pank, whose theories came in, mainly in the field of physical geography. So you had geomorphology, physical geography, that was the sole idea. But slowly and gradually, this theme shifted. This shifted to, let's say, radical geography under Pete, which started in the US. Then you had the humanistic geography that came up, the ideas of Marxist geography that evolved. So all these started to evolve outside Europe in the later periods. So initially we said that geography was something that uh, under which you had Europe that was the leading one. However, later on you had the formulations of uh, the various softwares, mainly the ArcGIS softwares under remote sensing GIS which started in US. So this idea which was European centric slowly and gradually started to disperse under different nations and this idea which was solely propagated by Europe or the major scholars we could say were from Europe, we could later on on see scholars from China, Asia and uh, American nations coming up. So that was the sole idea that you have to bring about in this question. The next question talks about the degree of importance of transport cost as a factor of industrial location with respect to footloose industry. Now even if we go on to the definition of footloose industry that was given by Alan, so uh, this definition talks about the least importance that has been given to the transport network. The idea is this footloose industry is a kind of hypothetical person who has a kind of foot under which you could fit any size of shoe. So if I had to fit in a shoe, I would require a specific size. But this hypothetical person has a capability that any shoe could fit in. So that's the sole idea that was brought under the footloose industry, stating that you do not have any restrictions in terms of distribution. It's free of location. Let's talk about the IT industry. So they are a classic example of footloose loose industry, watchmaking industry. So all these industries, you do not have to bo uh, bother much about the transportation cost because the final value, value addition and the final product that is going into the market in proportion to that, the transport cost here is negligible. So assembly and distribution is something that is focused here. So uh, Alenso focused on three basic mechanisms under that. The first was the relative decline that could be seen, the, seen in the prices of the transport inputs, the relative decline in the weight of the raw material due to the technological change and the complex processing that is required for the final output. So those three were the basic mechanisms that Alenso explained and he explained the footloose industry. The next question is pretty, pretty interesting. This question talks about two concepts, megalopolis and exopolis. Now understand the concept of megalopolis was given by Gottman. He basically talked about the mega urban system. So 
you have the cities these cities merge together to form conurbations and these conurbations come together to form a megalopolis for example bowash uh, so boston to washington you have a kind of megalopolis that extends so you have various metropolitans that come together and form a megalopolis this concept as we said was laid down by cotman on the other hand you had the concept of exopolis this was laid down by souza under the six discourses of post metropolis uh in the book post metropolis now souza basically talked about ex urbanity so both of those talked about ex urbanity but the souza's focus was on a single city and uh, what was believed was uh, this was based on the los angeles school model and the idea was that once you have a city initially the urban core was considered to be functional and symbolic unit of the urban core however later on the sprawl the uh, the nearby surroundings were all considered or were all having new cores that could be seen and that was the idea of city outside the city or uh, basically the inner city moving outside that was the idea that was given under exopolis so both of those talk about exurbanity now the question interestingly ask about whether the two can and do overlap so yes they do overlap so we can explain this by example of let's say you have the various metropolitans that are part of this uh, megalopolis system now let's say this metropolis a b c d e n f i have the first metropolis initially this was the core which was considered as the main city however now you have the sprawls the hinterlands which have become the core and this whole core which is the exopolis of this city so exopolis is for the city megalopolis is across cities okay so this exopolis is now the part of this megalopolis system so yes we can say that they do overlap and therefore it's a very very interesting concept now souza in the six discourses talked about exopolis as one of those besides that it was flexicity so flexicity talked about decentralization alongside the recentralization you have cosmopolis that talked about globalization you have sim city that talked about uh, simulation to real world you have had the arcreal uh, archipelago that talked about fortified city and finally there was metropolarities that basically talked about the issues that led to increasing social inequalities the next question was on peru's thesis for uh, economic growth and regional development so we have discussed that in one of the separate lectures you can refer that now the idea was forward and backward linkages so forward linkages basically promotes the next industry however backward li uh, linkages are linked to the industries which require the raw materials for for example steel industry requires raw materials from coal uh, from iron and steel so you have the backward linkages there however if we go forward for the construction industry steel required into construction and that's a kind of forward linkages that are provided so those are the forward and the backward linkages that are explained here now rostro's model also we have covered in one of the lectures the final stage is the no, is known as the stage of mass consumption here you have a huge amount of consumption that is seen uh, consumerism and a age of mass production so you have a huge quantity of production huge consumerism that is seen uh, the focus is mainly on uh, the goods that could be durable and that could be uh, used um, that could be used on a use and throw basis we could say uh, very high consumption moving towards tertiary sector of the economy and a kind of uh, um, more focus on the middle class customers who are really willing to pay the amount okay so that those are the things that are mentioned under the stages of mass consumption a very direct question on aerial differentiation so basically this idea talks about each area being unique and how we can differentiate the different areas uh, based on the regional and the uh, uh, the regional growth and the regional geography of that area so that's the sole idea that you have to bring about under aerial geography we have discussed that in the lecture the next question is again a very very interesting question now this question talks about pronatalist policies pronatalist population policies and antenatalist policies let's say a government which has which is witnessing or a country which is witnessing negative growth rate or a aging population will go for a pronatalist population policy why because they require the workforce they require people uh, who can pay the taxes so paying taxes 
is one of the major things that they require and a real workforce who could work for them. So those considering those things in mind, the nations which are on the verge of a negative population growth or an aging population would go for these pronatalist policies. A good example from Asia is Japan. From Europe, you have numerous examples. You have Germany, you have Sweden, you have Hungary, Czechoslovakia and so on and so forth. Now let's talk about some of those. Let's say in Sweden, you have 480 days of paid pet, uh, parental leaves that's both for the mother and the father e even in the case a child is being adopted in Hungary you have a maternity uh, phase of three years of which 168 days would be under 70 percent of the original salary so they are providing kind of incentives for adopting a child or persuade people to have child now what could be the benefits benefits could be as we said paid parental leaves uh, social security benefits, tax benefits, child support system, baby bonus schemes. You could have a reduction in the taxes that they have to pay, uh, equality bonus, re-entry training programs, financial securities that could be provided. So basically kind of incentives given uh, to the people to encourage having or persuade people to have or adopt more children. So that's how we work around the pronatalist policy. And the question talks about the implications on the women's workforce participation. So that's what we explained here. So how they could be promoted are some of the measures that have been given. Now there were two questions from uh, the section on welfare geography. The first question was the contribution of DM, DM Smith. Now Smith talked about welfare where he talked about defining the area of residence and working around who gets how much and uh, when. So uh, how, when and where was the major concern that Smith brought about. He also criticized the quantitative revolution in geography uh, considering the assumption of homogeneity that was laid down under the quantitative revolution. So he was influenced by the Marxist ideas and looked about on the fairer distribution of the wealth. He brought in certain case studies where he contrasted the poverty in Bangladesh to the wealth that was seen in Britain. Similarly, he talked about the issues of apartheid in South Africa and considered the social segregation that was seen in Europe and US during that time. So those were the kind of pictures that he really tried to uh, bring about. The next question is on Femin. Now before I explain anything on Femin, you have to explain a kind of brief difference between Femin and Drought here. So Drought basically is shortage of water, however Femin is shortage of food. Now this shortage of food could be due to any of the factors, one is water scarcity obviously but there are many more factors for example hoarding of the food you have economic conflicts social unrest political unrest that could be seen movement of the food uh, due to natural disasters that could be seen again you have lack of aid that is coming in from other nations specifically for the underdeveloped nations that we could see and uh, all of the factors leading to a reduction in the workforce a good example of the major famines could be the Irish famine, uh, which was basically the potato blight that was due to the infection that was seen on the potatoes. You have the Dutch famine that was seen, the Ethiopia famine that was seen due to poor governance. So these are some of the classic examples that you can bring about to explain the famine and different causes that were associated to the famines under these. So that's what has been asked in this question. The next is, Propound the ideas of sense of place as given by Thuan and Relf under humanistic geography. Now, first of all, you have to explain in summary the humanistic geography. Humanistic geography predominantly was laid down under three scholars, Batimar, uh, Relf and Thuan, of which Relf and Thuan talked about the concept of phenomenology. Phenomenology is what deals with topophilia, that is emotional attachment to a place. So that was the sole idea that they tried to brought about. Now, uh, Relf had a, a book in which he wrote the place and placelessness. So the idea of having an association to the place and an emotional tie to that place is very, very important. The role of territory, the kind of knowledge that you have, the expansion of knowledge that could be done and uh, the influence of religion or culture was some of the things that were highlighted by Tuan and Ralph. Uh, so Ralph and Tuan, so those were some of the things. And Tuan talked about geography as a mirror of man. So both of those scholars, their independent contribution and the contribution under phenomenology is very, very important. The next question talks about 
the role of Marxist philosophy in geographical research. So it talked about uh, reproduction of social reforms. Uh, we uh, we focus on the arguments against capitalism. So uh, the sense of uh, spatial integration that could be brought about by socio-economic merger or socio-economic relations that could be seen. And again, they focus on the concept of superstructure that is economic processes that could be studied by the theory of religion. So those were some of the major ideas that were laid down under the Marxist theories. Uh, the development under Marxism was very much related to the spatial interaction and later on the system of commune built up on this system or on these lines. The second question on geog uh, welfare geography is here. Now you have to answer this bit differently because this emphasizes spatial inequality and territorial justice. So you have to focus on issues like crime, poverty, hunger, deprivation, uh, malnutrition which we could say environmental degradation and you have to explain how welfare geography came in rise with the radical geography. It was against the quantitative revolution, the positivism, the model building theories that were laid down. So we have covered welfare geography in one of the lectures. You can refer that for further details. The next question talks about the quantitative revolution as a methodological foundation for modeling. Now, Again, we have discussed quantitative revolution in one of the lectures. Some of the scholars who worked on the quantitative techniques were Eckerman, uh, you have Weber, Christeller, and uh, Allman, and many other theorists who are geographers who laid down the quantitative revolution where they focused on inference, statistical techniques, mathematical modelings. So the idea was basically to work on pre uh, projections to forecast what could happen to explain or reduce the values under factors. So factor analysis was one of the techniques that was used. So those were some of the major points that provided a kind of methodological foundation for model building. And these model buildings were later on even used with your GIS uh, platforms where you were able to devise different models under the software. So initially started from quantitative revolution. And that's, for, that's why it's really, really important. The last question talked about the main thesis for limits to growth. Now this idea was propounded by Meadows. Uh, it was initially world 1, world 2 and world 3 concepts that were laid. The idea was the allocation of resources and the interaction of human and earth systems. So there were five points that were considered under that. Those were the population, industrialization, pollution, food production and resource depletion. However, this was criticized. The criticism was mainly it did not allow new predictions, new variables to be introduced but in reality that's not true. The predictions that were made were very very weak in this case and uh, it was basically trying to uh, constrict the idea of flexibility and adaptability that was given. So those were some of the major criticisms or drawbacks that this uh, limits to growth model had. So uh, with this we complete the second paper. The details have been mentioned in this uh, lecture so you can refer that. With this we complete the first paper. As we said, the physical geography questions were very very direct. You have to know a lot of theories but for your uh, human geography the questions were very very applic applicative and very very conceptual. So you must have a real good command over the subject. Uh, only then you can secure very good marks. We do have our rolling program for the online courses that is going on. Also you can refer the postal course where you would find nearly all of the content that was asked for your uh, paper one. We'll be working around paper 2 shortly, so stay tuned. Have a great day ahead.